Okay, so welcome to the block on automated predictive mapping using ensemble machine learning. So we will do a two hour block uh, and I will do about one and a half hour and then my colleague uh, Mohamed Reza uh, will uh, also do a half an hour block on some, uh, on a lit and do a little demo using MLR3. MLR3 is a new generation uh, machine learning. Uh, it's really a uh, fantastic uh, software and uh, we're very excited to use it. But uh, I actually uh, did most of my coding in MLR and I have most of my code in MLR. And I noticed that the transition to MLR3 is going to take time. So uh, we decided to do most of the examples in MLR. Uh, so the things I will show you. And then uh, we will also show you the MLR3. So that means that uh, for those of you who are more ambitious that you can jump in into MLR3 directly. Uh, so I will talk about ensemble machine learning uh, mainly for the purpose of uh, predictive mapping and I'm talking mainly about soil and vegetation mapping uh, and usually I finish doing these three steps uh, which is the fine-tuning feature selection and assembling um, and I tend to use the super learner algorithm the all the things I told you in the introduction block uh, and this uh, explanation of that uh, how that, that works in MLR it's uh, it's called a make stack learner function uh, so that explains how how it uh, works. Um, I started making this little package called LandMap. Um, it's uh, it's relatively ambitious, but uh, I didn't have time to, as I said, to put it on CRAN, uh, and it needs some uh, work still. So uh, I will go, do a demo with the LandMap, so I will show you how it works. Uh, it's really a, a Deus Ex Machina. So you uh, the projects that I used to do, like, step-by-step uh, step myself making decisions and looking at things. Now it's just a single line, poof. Um, so fully automated uh, approach. Um, and so that's a bit scary. Um, so we will see about that. Um, then um, uh, we will, I will also show you the, uh, how like I used to do geostatistics and I had like spatial autocorrelation, you fitting the uh, variograms um, uh, doing these uh, different types of Krieging transformations and I will show you how things look like now. Um, uh, with uh, In machine learning you can also combine geography with feature space um, and then you don't have to have all these statistical assumptions, uh, stationarity assumptions. Um, and then the next step beyond that is to, you just want to maximize accuracy, so you want to uh, increase the fine tuning uh, you want to uh, extend a number of learners you combine, um, and then you want to, uh, again, automate everything. So there's a usual, usual developments. Uh, we have also a book uh, called Predictive Soil Mapping with R. Uh, this is a R. Martin book. Uh, we're also proud that this book is available on the Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike, so it's not a commercial uh, book. Uh, so we're very happy. So you can use anything from the book as long as you cite the source. You don't need to any, ask for any copyright. Uh, we, are, we are very much promoting uh, open sharing of uh, information and especially scientific work. Um, so this book is available also. You can buy a printed copy. Uh, when you buy a printed copy, um, $12 is donated to Open Geo Hub for summer schools. So you do it uh, with a good cause. Um, so yes, this is a book. Uh, I don't know if uh, how many of you uh, maybe already used the book. Um, yes, few people. So uh, uh, we have some, it's a bit, uh, there's some discussion about soil variables and maybe people said, oh, you know, I just wanted everything in R, you know, and we don't have everything solved in R. So we have also some discussion about complexity of soil variables and how do you work with them, but we don't have everything in R. So we would like to extend this book. It's also nice when you don't go to a publisher, uh, then you can uh, keep on maintaining the book. So we just now make two new chapters and we just put it. There's no bureaucracy. There's no waiting. There's no approvals. You know, you just go and make it. So I like also that about doing a book outside of the commercial publishers. Um, this is a gen general spatial prediction scheme. As I said, this block will be about spatial interpolation, spatial prediction. So, so like general scheme is something like this. You start with some geographical phenomena. And so let's say if you're interested in, uh, um, for example, soil quality in Netherlands. Uh, so you say, well, our interest is soil quality. Uh, and then you say, well, we represent that soil quality with uh, analytical variables. So that will be like, I don't know, nitrates, measurements of nitrates, heavy metals, I don't know. 
So, and then you go and you, so you pick up that variables and then you collect samples. So you do some sampling design, you want to do it objectively. So you, you pick up some uh, probability sampling, I don't know. Uh, then you get the data uh, and then you pick up a library of uh, models that you can use algorithms. Uh, and then you, you, from data, you go to model um, and you estimate these uh, model parameters. And these model parameters you, you then use to do predictions. Basically you make a, a prediction for any uh, pixel and uh, you create a map um, and then and then you go back with that map you deliver it to the to the people that requested um, and now the question is if if that satisfies the uh, uh, is it fit for use uh, and if it's not uh, fit for use then you redesign and then redesign you could redesign collecting extra variables uh, you could just collect uh, more data from the same variables or you could just do updating of the model uh, and then you rerun that. So it's a, like a continuous process. Um, and then if it's uh, all good, if they say, okay, it's fit for our use, then they can do decisions uh, and they can do, uh, they, you can do scenario testing and you can do some uncertainty assessment. So that's like a general scheme and probably you, you're all aware of it, but uh, we put it here. Uh, back in 2013, we wrote this article on mapping efficiency. It's, it's a bit more theoretical article. So we, uh, we look at the, you know, what are the key, uh, uh, variables of engineering the spatial prediction and mapping processes. So if you look at the classical literature mm -hmm. in uh, soil mapping, uh, they will say, well, usually like, okay, cost is very important. So uh, when you do soil mapping, you, of course, you want to have a full control of the cost and you want to uh, 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 be sure how much you're going to spend, how much time you need, uh, how much time you need and effort. And so they made this simple formula, this uh, uh, colleagues from the uh, UK, uh, Burrow and uh, B and Ulf, uh, Ulf um, and uh, so they said, okay, it's all function of scale. So it used to be the the maps used to be like top of map one to twenty five thousand, one to ten thousand, one to fifty thousand. So they will say well, that's all function of scale, and it's all log log function. So if you know the uh, scale, so we we came to this uh, formula. Um, uh, so with these parameters, you can estimate how much, uh, depending how detailed uh, scale you want. Uh, you can estimate how much will it cost to uh, map an area. And, the, the, and this is the, usually the cost is uh, in uh, some unit like euros or something uh, per, per hectare. Okay, so that's a, it's a classical way of thinking. And so we wrote this paper, Mapping and Fishing Information Content. And um, it's one of the papers I'm really proud of, with very little citations, unfortunately, <laughs> because we look at uh, like hypothetical concepts and we came to this new idea. So it's very generic. Um, and we managed to prove it with the actual derivation, mathematical derivation, that um, uh, this mapping efficiency concept it, it's uh, it's correct, um, and also with the real data, but uh, very little citations. Uh, this is the example in uh, uh, USDA and uh, New Zealand and Canada. So this is the range of, uh, and this still, by the way, this is still used. That's still in use. People think in that way that you, uh, how much money it takes you to map a hectare of land. Um, but so we critically look at that and we say, no, actually, um, you need something like this. Uh, and we call it information production efficiency. And so that how much money does it take you to produce a, a, a effective byte of data? So, so I, I will try to explain that, but maybe it's a, it's a bit hard. So, so how much money does it take you to produce effective byte of data? And we looked, basically, we looked at the... Uh, uh, theory from physics, uh, the compression theory. So the effective data is the data that stays after compression. So in compression, you uh, like with the MP3, you know, when you listen to music, you notice that the raw data, the raw recording can be very long file, can be gigabytes. But when you want to listen to it, then you, uh, you finish with these files of like four megabytes or five megabytes, that's the MP3. Um, and so this is compression. And this compression is from physics, there's a Nyquist theorem that says that uh, you don't need the data, which is uh, everything which is beyond half of the uh, noise or the uh, uh, uncertainty in your data, half of that noise you can just remove. And that gives you, uh, that's an efficient way to compress data and that gives you the uh, efficient uh, data. So that's why the MP3 is only a few megabytes, but it cannot be less than a few megabytes. Because if you will go and further compress, it could happen that you will decrease the quality of the sound that people wouldn't use it anymore. So the MP3, it's really optimized. It's optimized data size. And these are these effective bytes. So when you have a famous musician, they produce a three megabyte song. 
So they produce three megabytes of, of useful information. Yes, and with the mapping, you do the same. You could also compress, if you take out the uncertainties, you could compress the data. So you take half of the prediction error and uh, then you compress the data and then the bytes you get, this is the effective bytes you produce. And then you don't, this has nothing to do with scale. So you could also, for example, you could make a map of Europe at very fine pixel resolution, but it can have effectively very little information. So after you compress it, it can be one kilobyte. You have a map of the world, which is like 10 meter resolution, but if all the numbers are the same, if you compress it, you will get one kilobyte. Yes, so th that's how this concept of uh, uh, effective information works. Um, and here's a bit better, yes? Yes, yes, there are different ways you can compress. Some uh, compression can be more efficient, less efficient, but they are uh, 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 asymptotic. So any compression today we have, they reach a plateau. You understand? They could be a bit more or less efficient, but any compression you make, I can tell you with any effective data, you reach a plateau, you cannot compress more. Like, as I said with the MP3, if I will go compressing more, it will deteriorate quality. Eventually people wouldn't use that because they wouldn't be able to listen to the uh, music. It's really, the, there's a, this uh, um, uh, magical uh, moment in compression where you keep the, all the useful information and all the things you don't need, uh, you remove. And that's this Nyquist theorem. And this is a simple example now here. You have uh, uh, raw data. Uh, so this is comes from interpolation, right? And you have the raw data. I can have a, a floating points. Yes, I can have many decimals, but they're insignificant because if I know what is my detection limit or the half of the uh, prediction error, uh, then I can compress, let's say if here it's a half, then I can compress all the values to integers. And also I can remove all the pixels where I have the errors are high. They're so high that I don't, I have a full uncertainty. Yeah, so I have only the pixels. So first I, I, um, um, I call the data into classes, uh, integers for example, and then I remove the pixels which are highly uncertain like what Hannah does also. Uh, and then I finish with the effective data. Okay, and this effective data then it's, uh, uh, it's the actual bytes I produced. And you see this is then independent of resolution. It doesn't matter what resolution, I mean not directly. So it, it usually does, you have more data if you have high, fine resolution, but you cannot fake it. You cannot just make a finer resolution by resampling because uh, effective data will stay the same. Um, and so then you do that. And so what you see here, uh, this is ordinary in this regression cleaning. And you see, we mask out the pixels where we have high prediction error. Uh, so that's the Kriging variance. And here we don't have that. So all the pixels are available. So we produce more bytes of data. And let's say if the little difference is just making a, a different code. So it means that I have a most cost effective system. So this system will cost uh, less money to create effective bytes of data. So per effective byte of data, it will cost less. And in this case, I calculated it costs 30% less. Yes, and that's very interesting, you know, when you do a, um, like a spatial analysis, spatial statistics, that you can come to economic analysis and you can show it that it's worth investing in machine learning, investing in better data science, because you say we reduce the cost uh, of production by 30, 40, maybe sometimes 80%. Yes, just by uh, doing something inexpensive, taking open source and doing a bit more coding. It costs our time maybe a bit more, but let's say when you get good at it, then it becomes very effective. So this is this idea of the uh, mapping efficiency. So I will come back to that over and over. Um, also in, in our book, yes, question. Yes. No, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. I use this. Yes, I agree. No, I agree. This formula was used for illustration, but it's just this uh, because what they do here, they will uh, estimate the cost per country. And in country, they will estimate that there's an average complexity. Yes, so there's an average complexity of New Zealand, of Netherlands. Obviously, Netherlands, you don't have to climb any slopes, but yeah, there are some slopes though. 
Um, so, uh, so that depends on complexity. But so then they come with this, but it's simplified. And there are other books that say, okay, you have to take into account the effort, you know, field, field work effort, uh, then the cost of lab analysis is usually the most expensive, things like that. But uh, this was just to emphasize that this idea of cost per hectare is really one dimensional. And uh, when, you when you talk about really mapping efficiency, uh, we came up to conclusion that you know it should be uh, replaced with something which is really important, and that's the accuracy, the getting the increasing the accuracy. So explaining more information, being, being more efficient to produce more information. Um, okay, so that was about that. This is from the book, uh, the predictive cell mapping with R. We, uh, this is a school example. It's a, a mass data set. And so what we do here, I will open that um, example. So what we do, I, um, I, I just want to show to the people, like what is the idea of uh, this benefit of uh, uh, doing uh, more complex uh, modeling, why? Um, so uh, you could go, uh, and that's very nice in the current package. Uh, what's very nice in the current package that this idea of uh, in increasing the complexity of model uh, can be incorporated very easily. Um, Okay, and I jumped somewhere. Okay, one more time. So, so in a current package, uh, this idea of increasing the um, uh, complexity of model, it can be in the code. It's very elegantly integrated uh, by just by just changing basically the model. So you have the same yes. Yeah, I just did it, but then the whole book goes. <laughs> uh, let me see. See, when I do this, uh, yeah, it just jumps. Uh, so I have to go back and reopen, but no problem here. Also, it uh, the book freezes a bit uh, when I just open it. Let's see. Okay, now we are we end. Now I'm not increasing anything. So, so what you see in the current package, uh, you pick up this uh, regression matrix, and I'm looking at organic matter. So organic matter or soil organic carbon. Um, and the most simple uh, estimator is if I just say uh, I have 150 points, and I just uh, estimate the average of the 150 points, and that gives me also estimate of how much uh, organic carbon I have. So I don't have any information. I don't do any modeling. I just say, uh, I throw the points and I estimate what is the mean. So that's also a model. You see that model is basic organic matter is a function of intercept. Okay, it's a formula like this. Then I could say, okay, I use the soil map. So I say organic matter is a function of soil map, which is in this case, it's a, it's a indicate, it will be an indicator variable. The GLM package will convert it to indicators. And then what you get, you get more or less the same as here, except you get the means per uh, mapping unit. Okay, so you add a bit more information. Uh, and then you go and you say, okay, now let's do also continuous covariance. So I add distance to the river, I add soil, and I add the flooding frequency. So I have more information, but I still use a GLM. And then the last thing is I use all this data, but I use Ranger. And, and you can run that, you can run that and repeat it uh, five times. So you do five time cross validation with refitting, and that's very elegant. It's in few lines of code. You run it, and then you plot this performance. And this is this mapping efficiency now. So what happens is that you see that the the just if you take the mean, and if you add the soil map, you 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 have a significant statistically significantly more information. So you the soil map adds information which is not available just from the points. There's, there's no overlap in distributions. Then if you add even more information, you will still move it. You still move, there's also no overlap. And also when you do random forest, you finish still decreasing for about uh, 30, 40%. You decrease the original variance from just using the average. And this is this increase in the efficiency. And this is not by mistake. This is repeated cross validation. So you can run it many times. You get a bit different results. But if I repeat with this data, even thousand times, I will always get about the same result. Yes, and so you see in the, when I use the, just the, 
as uh, just the points, I will explain about 25% of variability. And when I use the random forest, I will explain about 55% of variability. So there's a, there's a significant gain. And that uh, also uh, financially, I can show that uh, we decrease the production cost for effective byte of data. Because let's say if I use the same point sample, so I didn't have to collect extra point samples, I had to pick up this covariance, but it's a low cost. The only thing I do is a bit more computing. The computing is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So I can show, show you that I can increase computing efficiency and I can increase the cost of production for like 30, 40% by using random forest. Okay. Uh, so I was, as I said in my slides, I spent a lot of time in my PhD. Uh, I was very enthusiastic about uh, geostatistic Krieging. Um, Krieging is like basically more simple terms. Uh, you have the point that you generate a map. So I was really enthusiastic about it. And it was my first uh, passion for data science. Um, and then in some 2012, I think I first heard of Caret and I started doing a bit more in R. Um, and then I also started testing machine learning and random forest was my first technique back in 2013, first time. 2014, we published a paper. Uh, so I got more and more interested in, it's like in general machine learning. Uh, and I started seeing that, yeah, you could, you could do, uh, um, you could do improvements. So you could improve the accuracy. Um, and then, um, you could also, uh, make the projects uh, more attractive, you know, because if you increase accuracy, then more and more people are interested. Um, and then we started doing this predicted soil mapping PSM. And in many cases, we realized that. Uh, what really slows us down is, for example, spatial resolution. Uh, so when you uh, move to finer resolution, so if you have a project and 100 uh, meter resolution, you want to move to 50 meter, uh, that blows up everything four times. So you have to consider that your budget is going to go higher. Uh, so that was, uh, and then we also started moving to doing two dimensional to three dimensional mapping. So we wanted to go through depth and we saw, okay, can we do 3D with machine learning? Um, and then uh, later on, we saw the time. So we went from 2D to 3D, and then we went to 2D plus time, and then we went to 3D plus time. And then in 2016, we did a couple of papers uh, mm -hmm. doing the full four dimensional data and doing machine learning random forest on space time. So we had uh, uh, measurements uh, through time uh, at uh, stations that were also through depth. So we have a fully four dimensional system 3D plus time and we published some papers and it was also uh, in the prediction spatial competition game this data set. So I'm very happy that person that brought the data then we did the paper and we had the fun doing that modeling. Um, so, uh, so that was a, a development. Um, then what happened is the once you make the data. Uh, when you do the mapping, you want to distribute the data and uh, usually distributing data was like in the old days, you make a report and you send on a floppy disk. Uh, I don't know, here's a copy. Uh, so that was the old, but today these things change. So you want to rapidly distribute the data and you want that the people use the data without a need to do uh, install any software or, or understand any GIS. And then we uh, started the, uh, looking at the web mapping and web GIS applications. And we are still working on that and then doing the services so they can, people can just ping something and develop their own application on top of R. Um, so this is, this is how the things uh, basically evolved. Um, uh, this uh, thing about spatial resolution. Um, uh, we have a very interesting uh, discussion, Herod Huvelink and me in the pedometer and you can follow it online. You know, we sit in the same, we used to sit in the same uh, room in uh, office, um, and then uh, he wrote this uh, some article uh, about criticism and some of these ideas, because I was talking a lot about oh it's all about pixel size. Uh, I got this paper um, uh, on pixel size, and and uh, and he says no, you know it's not uh, this secondary, it's the accuracy. So he wrote this it's accurate, it's stupid. So then I had to reply to him back uh, because I said okay, since you mentioned me uh, and you start with the title uh, stupid, uh, I have to write back. Um, so we have this exchange, but we sit in the same office. It was funny. Um, so so he, here he shows like uh, that you could have something which is a coarse resolution, but it's more accurate. So let's say if this map is more accurate than this one. So who cares that you have a very fine pixel resolution? Um, 
so that was basically his uh, his uh, hypothesis that it's all about accuracy. So it's and it, it is in our model, but in uh, practice, you know, I, I I put this formula. So I sent that formula also in reply to that uh, letter. Uh, so I said uh, no, actually something like this. Uh, so um, the what is really what defines the success of a predictive mapping project. So first thing is the relevance. So you can have a perfect map but you didn't make it for people to mm -hmm. use it. You pick up the wrong variables or you're doing something that doesn't match their decision. So first thing is the relevance. Then you have also location accuracy. You can make a map that in average, when you do cross validation, it's more accurate, but the maps are about two things. The maps are about where is it and how much is it? So it's not only how much is it, you also have to know where is it? You could have a very coarse resolution. So for example, you could say, that in Netherlands there's a 17.2 million citizen yes and you can be very accurate about that you say I know in Netherlands it's 17.2 blah 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 you know up to the uh, last to the individual citizen so it could be high accuracy but with the maps you also want to know where they are so you could have a perfect estimate that that's the thematic accuracy but you don't know where the people live right so what what I think the success of project is if you have both you want to know where the people live in Netherlands and also in average how much uh, uh, other in each pixel how many people live or each polygon. Um, then the other thing is the completeness. Uh, many projects you have fantastic data, um, but you people don't complete. They have they have missing areas. They have missing pixels. And they, as I showed you in this map, if you take out the pixels, we have a, a uncertainty very high. You never completed. You didn't complete and this completeness slows down usability because imagine completeness like this if somebody has to make a decision based on your map and you have a, a something which is incomplete so they can never make a full decision yes yeah? so then it also decreases the success of the project and then the other thing is the access i noticed many projects they will publish a paper and they say we made this awesome work and then you say, well, how do we access? And then they say, oh, you have to write email. You have to fill in the form. You have to do that. So access can also be a bottleneck for success. And then the last thing is the price. Of course, if you overprice your data, uh, then you also decrease its usability. So that's, it's an interesting discussion. As I said, we had uh, that he just wrote, it's just accuracy. And I said, no, it's more, more things. But anyway, I will be interested in your opinion and let me know if you think we miss something here. So that would be very interesting feedback we could get. Um, okay, so that was very generic introduction. Now about regression creating. So in regression creating this technique where you, you have like this two type of modeling, you do the regression with the feature space, and then you get the residuals, and then you fit the variant for residuals, then you interpolate the residuals, and you add the residuals to predict the trend. And that's why we call it regression creating because it's two modeling. And they can elegantly be sometimes combined if you do linear modeling. In GOR, you do it at once. It, it will estimate the regression coefficients and the variant parameters at once. Um, and so that's that's kind of the state of the art geostatistics, more or less. So doing this regression creating or universal creating. But they're basically synonyms. There are some computational differences, but it's the same technique. Um, and as I said, I had, if you Google, if you just Google regression thing, you most likely get this paper. Okay, I Google this from my machine, every machine when you Google gets a different thing, but there's a good chance you will finish with this paper. Um, and so, as I said, people call me still, hey, you're the regression creating person, yeah? But I actually, in 2016, I stopped, uh, more or less, I stopped using uh, geostatistics. So, um, um, I mean, using it for the actual work for with the actual data. And I switch my interest completely to machine learning. Question, uh, Anto? Yes. Uh, and there's something I'm thinking about a lot. Like, if it's, uh, yeah, are you able to do that, or is that the model flawed? Because uh, well, first of all, you might not have 
autocorrelation? Yes, so if you, uh, that's what I did in uh, back in 2014, I will, I sw switch from linear regression to random forest and then I wanted to do random uh, creaking on the residuals on random forest. And what I realized that it's a uh, random forest so efficient that you leave your left with a very little variation. Uh, and then I, for me, it was just pain doing this screen because it was just predicting little component, but it's computational. It was just a pain. I was like, thinking, oh, this is not good. Um, and especially when you do creaking on like, you know, millions of pixels, you know, it's not, it's, then I was looking for parallelization of creaking. You know, I was looking for algorithms to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, I will tell you about this. That's why I do this block. Uh, I completely integrated uh, geography into the random forest. So, yeah, so there's no need to do no need to do really creaking because you have the same spatial structure. Okay, well let's take a look. That's why we do this block. I don't I don't claim to have solution for everything, but I yes. Question? Mm -hmm. No, please put it on MetaMost, uh, share it on MetaMost. I, I heard, yeah, I heard there's a couple of packages that try to do that. I still, you know, I, I do like the G GOR, for example. That's my, uh, I think that's like our school example of um, where you have a geostatistic implemented that you do this transformation, back transformation properly and uh, you do iterative fitting of the variogram. So, so uh, and that's this book model based geostatistics, uh, Diggle and Ribeiro. Um, so I do, I did use that and I put it in land map package. So you can still do, I still think the fitting variables is very useful. Uh, fitting variables, getting get estimate what is the range of spatial dependence, what is the nugget, you know, that's very useful. Uh, but I don't do it for the uh, Kriging, I don't use anymore. I don't, I don't find it, uh, I don't find it necessary. It's just, I, you know, I think there are more flexible techniques. Um, so, so just to say, uh, Kriging, let me just uh, finish this. Uh, so, so in Kriging, uh, uh, the thing with the Kriging, so this is this uh, uh, issue with uh, when you when you learn geostatistics. So, uh, the first thing you look uh, you look at your variable and you look what you know what's the transformation in it, what's the distribution of variable. So you can have a normal variable which is very rare, very rare variables. Not always, usually the the quantities are your log normal. Um, then you have zero inflated models and you have the gamma, you have Poissonic. You, you saw lots of this data in this summer school. I think through the summer school, you saw some, uh, I think um, uh, Paula was presenting some zero inflated data. Uh, so that's these um, uh, outbreaks and things. Uh, and we had also some Poissonic data, which are the counts. Um, so we saw this. And then the second thing you do, the variables, and here you have to also do some choices. Um, so the variables you need to get them from residuals. Um, so you can do REMOL, um, and then with the uh, covariates you can do maybe PCA, um, then also things change on the uh, support size, uh, you have this mist, mixed effects and uh, so it, it's complex. Um, and then you do prediction and then you validate prediction. So that's, uh, and that's uh, here the shortest code possible. Um, so you, you take this uh, mass data set uh, and you convert uh, the, you just have to convert to this geo format. Uh, so if you take zinc, you say I make a geo file, a geo object, and uh, then I specify uh, there's no, let's say I, I specify, oh sorry, this is the, um, uh, so it's log normal. Um, and then I put, have to put initial variogram because it needs initial variogram, you cannot fit without initial variogram. So I put initial variogram uh, and then it will run REML. And then I get the variogram and then I do a, a Kriege conventional uh, and I say I want to predict the dislocations and this is my ob, uh, model, variogram model. And then it will uh, say, okay, I do this, I do a box, Cox data transformation, then does prediction and then does the back transformation. Okay, so that's the GR, that's the state of the art. Um, and then you get that map. Um, and then in between, you see, uh, if you look at the trends, that's about the time that I switched to uh, Random Forest. Uh, that's the Google Trends, uh, Kriging and uh, Random Forest. <laughs> so, uh, so that's about the time I switched. And it, uh, Google also reflects that there um, much, was much higher interest in um, 
uh, random forest and Krigin. It was only in uh, Brazil they were still they were still in, more interested in Krigin. Uh, but the rest, the China and uh, Europe and US, they, uh, Australia, they all went for uh, random forest. And, and there's this famous article. If you have time, please read it. It's a really fantastic article. It's called uh, Two Cultures. It's uh, written by the person who uh, basically developed the first uh, version of random forest. Uh, so he calls it Two Cultures. And uh, it's about uh, basically the, the way I understand it, you have this uh, purely data culture that you say, I have no assumptions about structure, distribution, anything. It's just, I want to adjust everything to the data. It's kind of a data religion. And then you have this model-based culture uh, where you uh, obsess uh, about the distribution model. And there is a beauty in that, you know, when you look at the Gaussian distribution, uh, so the beauty of a model in Gaussian distribution is that actually it has only two parameters. It has the mean and standard deviation. There's a mathematical formula and you only have to determine two parameters and you can make lots of distributions, you know, so you, you reduce the complexity to something very simple. So, and that's the, that's really beautiful when you think about it, that somebody managed to reduce, uh, in this case was uh, Gauss, Johannes Gauss, or what his name, uh, so he managed to reduce that complexity to a mathematical formula, two parameters. Then you look at the machine learning world and uh, you have these models with like tens of thousands of parameters. It doesn't matter how many parameters. The only thing that matters is whether you can get that pattern, whether you can predict something, whether you have that magic of the algorithm uh, to recognize these patterns and not by chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are these two cultures, but please read it. I feel like I, I moved slowly to this culture of data science. I feel like I'm moving there, but I, okay, I don't now delete all in my head, all my knowledge of geostatistics. I just don't use it the same way, especially for, um, for the operational projects. Um, there was this also famous uh, story. There's an excellent documentary. Uh, uh, he's a, a Korean uh, person and he was the world champion in Go. Um, and uh, he never lost any game, I think, or something like that. And he played five games uh, versus uh, Google um, um, a deep learning uh, team, uh, and he lost four to one. Uh, and that was a big surprise. And please watch the documentary. Uh, he was everybody was surprised that he could uh, uh, lose so badly. Uh, but every every few years now, computers beat us in all these games where we thought that you requires like fun, uh, highest level. Uh, creativity and uh, something unpredictable. Uh, so he lost uh, 41. Uh, then there was also um, DeepMind also won uh, some uh, computer games, uh, which are also very complex and they're very, not easy to actually. Uh, so the chess is like very simple example, right? Chess is already gone. I mean, that was from 1997. We cannot be the best computers anymore in chess. So we already passed that uh, line. Uh, but for the this one, the uh, StarCraft, uh, they were very surprised that the computer managed to beat uh, actual people uh, because uh, it's uh, multitasking. It's, uh, you know, it, it can develop in very, very different ways. Uh, so they were really surprised that the Google team also managed to beat. Um, um, and so, uh, and there's this uh, funny paper, funny paper, uh, interesting paper uh, group, um, uh, MIT. Um, they uh, said that actually they, they were surprised how you can use this uh, relatively simple machine learning like neural nets uh, to explain, uh, um, explain lots of complex data and uh, complex patterns. And so just uh, you just get this data and do training and you can explain really complex stuff. And it's also, oh, they said it's almost magical. So they published this paper, Extraordinary Living Between Deep Neural Networks and the Nature of the Universe. Um, so yeah, that's very interesting. And then the group in Jena, and I completely agree with them. They published this paper that if you do machine learning, but if you avoid all the processes, all the knowledge about processes, uh, that you are making a mistake uh, because you know for sure it's suboptimal. And they uh, envisage that uh, the real uh, development that is going to be exciting is development of so-called hybrid, uh, uh, so data-driven, uh, process-based driven models, where you, you model all the processes uh, the best you can and then you use machine learning just to calibrate that processes. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the idea of this paper. And I, I fully agree with the authors. Um, and also, as I told you uh, yesterday, uh, doing machine learning, in the beginning for me, it was a lot of excitement. As a data scientist, I was like, I can crunch large data, I'm getting better R-square. 
uh, but later on I became more critical and now I feel also the most important book in machine learning is not the ones that explain you just how to use algorithms, but the ones that explain you how to do diagnostics and how to discover uh, problems with machine learning. And then one of the books that sticks out here is this interpretable machine learning, which is also our book down uh, book and I share the link with you so you can find it. Um, a typical uh, example of uh, how the um, um, diagnosis can help you understand the problems. Uh, this is um, a bulk density. Uh, so that's a pedal transfer function for bulk density. That's Australian data. And I use this random uh, forest uh, SRC package. Um, and so we had enough data so we could fit a, a pedal transfer function. So we predict the bulk density using uh, gravel, clay, sand, uh, organic carbon, and depth. And so in many cases, it's uh, the expected uh, relationship. So if you look at the carbon uh, soils with the more organic carbon, uh, they uh, tend to have a smaller bulk density because the soil is more pushed uh, around. Uh, so the bulk density drops. Um, and also with the depth, you see the bulk density increases because the soil is more compact as you go deeper. Uh, so these are all expected relations. But with the for, uh, random forest SSC, you can also plot that uh, predicted uh, random forest uh, line. And you can predict uncertainty and you can see that so these are these extrapolation effects so applying this model um, you know there's a problem now here because uh, the model uh, the fit because i have not so many data for the high organic carbon so if i will go to any uh, place where i have like a 15 percent carbon the bulk density starts growing again and and it, it can if you extrapolate this line it could go somewhere here so eventually if you have a really high organic carbon it will have the same bulk density as low and that's, that's an error. Me as an expert, I can go and say, no, this model is up till here, it's okay. But beyond that, it's overshooting and there's a problem. And so uh, when you do this diagnostic plot, you can, you can detect where the problems are and you can say, no, we have a problem here. So don't this model, uh, then we come to these conclusions. Okay, what is the uh, area of uh, what, how was it called? The, area of applicability. So you will say, okay, maybe beyond this point, it's not applicable. And you could you and you make the decision there as an expert. Then as an expert, it's very easy to validate this and to understand why the things go wrong. Um, and so that's this interpretable machine learning. Okay, so uh, I was very excited about machine learning and I started using it just to make the maps, soil maps. Uh, but, you know, I ignore the spatial autocorrelation. I ignore this thing from statistics and it was a frustration. So I thought about it for a couple of years and uh, then I came to the idea, okay, let's try to put geographical distances um, into the random forest. I just wanted to test, I was just, you know, as an experimenting as a scientist, as a uh, person who likes to innovate, I like to test things out. So I was just testing things out. And, uh, and then out of this testing, I got, okay, this is very interesting. So we wrote this paper um, and we said, okay, actually you could use a random forest. You don't have to do any creeing. Uh, you could use random forest to do spatial prediction with spatial autocorrelation and everything. And so we wrote the paper and there is also a tutorial and I will go through some of these things from tutorial today, uh, but it's a step-by-step -step explanation. And we also, explain uh, how to do a 2D continuous uh, binomial categorical variables. And if you have extreme values, what you have to be careful with, et cetera. Yes? Machine learning, yes. Random forest. Uh, the, there are multiple aspects. So one of the things was the accuracy. Uh, so usually it will be the same accuracy, it's better especially if the data set becomes bigger and you have more and more covariates and the covariates have a non-linear relationship, then it's always better than GR. Uh, in one case, we had a, a even better geostatistics where the relationship was close to linear and then uh, random forest, because it's ensemble, it was a bit smoothing out. It was smoothing to out much, so the accuracy uh, dropped a bit. But it could be probably with fine tuning, we could get the random forest. I didn't do too much fine tuning. But probably with fine tuning, we could get even random forest to match that geostatistics. So, uh, but what was very important is that with the uh, Kriging, various sorts of Kriging, you need all these assumptions. Yes, and you have the worst assumption is this um, assumption that you, you have a constant variogram, that the variogram is the same, right? 
And then uh, in random forest, you don't need that because it's tree based. You can make a map, which is in some places is a smooth uh, variation, some place variation happens uh, uh, at shorter distances. So you don't need that assumption. So you have more flexibility. And then the other thing, uh, which was always frustration for me in regression creating, is that I do two models, the regression and variogram. I do them like separately. And always you, you have these iterations you can do. You do uh, regression uh, coefficients, then you do variogram, then you go back and recompute. So you can do these iterations. Yes, but I never liked it. It was it was something you know like you uh, it's a chicken egg problem a bit, right? And with the random forest, you just put everything on one pile, and you get a single model fitted. And this model it can be non-linear and it's uh, non-static. So it's uh, uh, depending on if you have enough data, it will locally adjust uh, uh, to the dependencies. Yes. I, I really don't believe anymore uh, if you use an uh, anisotropic uh, variogram. Yes, I will tell you, I will, I will tell you my opinion. Uh, maybe I'm a bit biased, but I am like this articles I showed you. I don't think that, uh, you know, humans can beat in the goal chess, all these games, uh, deep, deep mind. I don't think we can beat them anymore. It's gone. It's behind the horizon. And also for me, many methods in statistics, they're behind the horizon. You just have a methods that are just more flexible. And it's just a question of computing and doing, uh, getting better quality data to increase the accuracy. So yes, I, I hope it answers your question. Also another Yes. Yes. Uh, many machine learning techniques don't need the transformation. They don't. They have no assumption. Um, uh, so uh, many don't need. But I do tend to sometimes I do principal components, and I do it mainly to. Um, uh, reduce the number of uh, uh, features. It's a feature reduction. And also I notice if you have any noise in the data with the principal component analysis, you push the noise towards the last uh, component. And then eventually you can filter it out. When you do feature selection, usually the noise gets uh, excluded. So it's a kind of a noise reduction and uh, feature space reduction. But officially Render Forest doesn't need principal components. There's no need to do it. Uh, okay, so this is this uh, in this paper we made this generic uh, idea. And so we said it's like this: you have basically geographical co uh, covariates, geographical feature space, you have the uh, surface reflectances, and you have the processes. So this is Earth observation data, this is geography, and this is process-based modeling. So we said this is the generic approach. And then if you apply random forest to add that F, right, then you do everything at once. And that's what we try to do uh, and with the distances. And first we uh, derive just Euclidean. This is a Euclidean distance, so that's a point and then distance around it. But you can also plug in in random forest, which you cannot plug in in Kriging. You can calculate these distances on the, for example, effort distance, so the distance on terrain. So moving, moving to this point is a bit faster than moving to this point because you have more terrain here. And then the other type of distances is this, and which I always find as a frustration in Kriegi, that you have these watersheds. And if you look at the two points that can be close to each other, imagine there's a point here and point here. They are close to each other in Euclidean space, but in the watershed space, they're really far away. There's like a ridge between, and actually they're not part of the same watershed. So the material that streams to one point, it doesn't stream to the other point, but you can have some other point down the stream and this one is actually connected with this point on up the stream. So you could also compute this uh, so-called upslope and downslope distances. So you could plug in also these other types of distances in machine learning. And, uh, and then you put everything together and you just do computing. And Torsten Behrens, uh, independently from what we were doing, I just heard that they're working on something. They also published in the same year, a similar type of article the same year, 
and they also looked at these Euclidean distance, they call it Euclidean distance fields, uh, but they started looking only at these uh, distances to the edges of the center of the study area. So they are kind of just a, um, um, how do you call it, like a, um, the, uh, the study area bounding box uh, distances. Uh, so they did that and they got also result. Um, uh, then the other thing is a spatial resolution. I have this paper on soil organic carbon. You see, it's I think it's much more important the, the, to do the, get the proper spatial resolution uh, than to do, uh, for example, um, whether you use a random forest or support vector machines. I think it's much more important. We look now uh, going to this uh, finer spatial resolution. We push it because we we have a now a, a nice development that the European Union and European Space Agency released all this data publicly. So this uh, uh, enormous amount of data actually, Earth observation data ready, and we just have to move to this finer resolution. But computational is not easy. You know, this GeoHarmon as a project, we spent about 40% of the project just for the complexity of moving to large data sets. Um, and so now this is an example of, uh, you saw the code in GeoR, so I need to pick up a, a, a transformation myself. I have to choose the transformation. Then I have to set initial variogram. Uh, then I have to, um, uh, what was it? Uh, so I have to pick up also uh, for the variogram, I have to pick up which are the features I put inside and if I do any transformation. And then anisotropy also I have to define, yes? So there's all these things you have to do in just this. Now this is machine learning. You take all the points and you calculate buffer distances. There's no input, it's all automatic. And then you say, fit a ranger model, uh, the zinc is function of distances. Yeah, as simple as it gets, nothing. There's no, there's no complexity. I don't have to do anything, no decision. And uh, this is the uh, comparison. That's, that's what you get, the left is the state of the art, you have to know all the uh, statistics, uh, you know, all the transformation. Blah, blah. And this is just, hey, here are the distances, random forest. And this is where I got really, yeah, I got wow. Um, and uh, so, but what is very interesting here, it's the spatial dependent structure. So these spatial dependent structures, you don't, you see, but you're not aware. This is the smoothness of the map. Okay, if the spatial, if the variant was like shorter range or, or the ratio between the seal and nugget was different, you will see a different pattern. But the spatial dependent structure of the two is more or less the same. So random forest managed to pick up the spatial dependent structure. It didn't need any variable. It didn't need any transformation. It managed to pick the spatial dependent structure. This is a log normal variable. So we have the uh, very skewed distribution. You have a few high, very high values and the rest is very small. Um, and so the GOR here does better because uh, it gets these spikes, uh, but the random forest is does smooth out. But nevertheless, the output distribution is still skewed. So it doesn't smooth out the distribution. So it uh, recreates the spatial dependence and it doesn't smooth out the distribution. And that's where I got interested in random forest. Then I started testing with different data sets and I continue to get about the same result. So this is all universal green random forest. This one is a high anisotropy. That's the question on isotropy. You run the random forest, if you have an isotropy, you also get an isotropic output. Uh, so that's why I got really interested. And then I started also looking at the space time data. So you add a, a cumulative day and day of the year, and you do, we did a, a interpolation of space time property like a, a daily rainfall. And uh, so that's the, the daily rainfall with the random forest, and this is the daily rainfall uh, with uh, a space-time Krieger and Krieger uh, space-time. And you see also very similar. So uh, so yeah, we, we were surprised that it works so well. Um, and uh, it is, uh, yeah, it's a really game changer because uh, you don't have any requirements uh, uh, conditions, you know, no distribution uh, conditions. Uh, you don't have to fit the variable at all and you reproduce the spatial dependent structure uh, and also it works with hotspots. We figure out if you do fine tuning, you can get random forest to find the hotspots and re reproduce them. Um, and you can add all these more complex distances. Actually you can pile up all this stuff in one big pile. And it is like in the KXCD, you just pile up the thousands of covariates and distances and you just run machine learning 
And as long as you don't make a mistake, you will produce a feasible map, which looks like uh, produced by geostatistics. And so, so that was the, the discovery. Um, and so now there's lots of opportunities. So we would like to do uh, global uh, models also and do space time more and more. And we would like to combine with the process-based modeling. And so there are now quite some ideas to do it. So there's a lot of opportunities. So if you're interested, I can point you to some uh, references, some work which is under development. Um, so yeah, that was the long story, but there are still uh, there are still problems with uh, using machine learning for uh, spatial interpolation. Uh, so what happens is the uh, the first thing that pops up is these extrapolation problems, uh, which are mainly connected also with the quality of sampling. Um, and then you have the computational intensity. I will show you in my landmark package when I run it. You will see we wait, you know, 30 seconds, even small data set. The GOR will get it in a split of a second. So let's say I have to compute at the order of 10,000 or 100,000 more. So 100,000 more than with the geostatistics. So for sure there is a bit of uh, uh, problem there. Then we have these overfitting problems with the uh, machine learning. Uh, and also I don't know at the moment how to produce, for example, geostatistical simulations and how to do like a co-creating systems and things. So this thing I don't know. This is this famous plot uh, uh, by, um, uh, written by Peter Ellis. Uh, it's called, uh, the, the blog is called, um, uh, Extrapolation is uh, Tough for uh, a Forest. Uh, and he shows with uh, uh, like synthetic data, he shows that, uh, yeah, if you do a linear model and if you do random forest and Madeline explain you what happened is that uh, the random forest can only train in the uh, space where it has uh, training data, uh, can predict only where it has training data. If it lacks the training data that takes the last knowledge. So the last knowledge in feature space and just puts everything there and, it, and then it creates this artifact. Um, so, uh, and so, and then switching from random forest. So what happened with me in last two years I went like random forest, random forest, and then I switched to ensembling. And now I do exclusively everything ensembling. I don't do any more, rarely I do any projects where I just pick up a one random forest of this model. Everything is an ensemble approach. And ensembling, it might sound complex to you, but it's just a step, uh, it's just a going a step further, that's it. And there is a software solution for that. Uh, before it didn't exist, so you have to make your own code. Now there's a, a, a very um, a robust solution uh, and publish algorithms that uh, uh, explain how to do ensembling. And so I spent some time looking at this ensembling uh, frameworks. So I came up to these uh, four groups. Uh, so one is the H2O in California. Uh, the other is the Max Kuhn and uh, his packages and so carrot tidy models. And then the third group is the MLR, uh, which is a group in Germany mainly. And then there's a super learner. It's the person from, I think from Berkeley, also from California, they make the super learner. They're also connected with H2O. So that's the four groups I found in the R. Uh, and then I started testing and using, and it was a long time. It's so, you know, one year just seeing, you know, how do I use this? How do I use that? Um, and that's all in the book also now, predictive cell mapping. You can see, okay, comparison if you use H2O, if you use the super learner, et cetera. And for a long time, I liked the super learner. I like the super learner because it's very well explained and it's based on a, a good paper, good work. There's a PhD thesis around uh, behind it. Uh, so I really liked it. And then in the meantime, I tweet some, tweeted something and then I got contacted by Patrick Schratz and he says, oh, why don't you tr test MLR? I said, what is MLR? And then I started testing it and I realized actually it's very well done. And I met the people in the group and now we also and uh, getting uh, uh, more and more thinking about collaborating. Uh, and so now we switch completely to MLR. So the MLR is our main framework and we do basically everything in MLR. And now there's a new version MLR3 and so Mohamed Reza is going to tell you about it. Uh, this is the super learner by Eric Poli um, and uh, Mark van der Laan. Uh, so, uh, so then uh, as I said, they're from Berkeley. And so they look at this, you see you can have many models and then the red model is the ensemble. Uh, but how do you get, how do you estimate that model? So they came to this uh, algorithm um, where uh, they penalize a bit more than other algorithms. Uh, so they penalize a bit more. And then when you do the testing of the uh, ensemble versus other techniques, there's no magic. I mean, you never get 
like much better ensemble. Rarely will get much better, uh, but in average, you always get about 5%, 10% better than any individual model. And that's the logic behind the ensemble that you can still increase the accuracy. Uh, but I, what I especially like about ensembling that you, when you do uncertainty assessment, because you use multiple learners, which are different models, different designs. So when you do the uncertainty of assessment of ensembling, it becomes a model free assessment of uncertainty. So you're not biased to using random forest or using that, but it becomes really model free assessment. And that's what I also like about ensembling that you can, I think you can get a more objective idea of the uncertainty. Um, this is the, as I told you, there are these three groups of covariates. There's the geographical covariates, process-based covariates, and earth observation data. And this is kind of the general workflow. And we, that's also in our paper on the last page. That's what we envisage as a general framework uh, for spatial prediction. So it will go in a multi-process, multi-process. So you, uh, you do this uh, ensembling, you make the predictions. You get the prediction map, and then based on prediction map, you can do a second round sampling. So wherever you have a high errors, you collect new data, and then you redo the process. You do as many times you need until your RMSE drops to the level which is satisfactory to make decisions. And this is the framework we do suggest now for any project if you want to start doing predictive mapping using machine learning, let's say, then uh, this will be a framework. Repeated sampling, you sample in the places where your models are, uh, have the poorest performance. And then you, uh, if you uh, do a couple of iterations, you should come very quickly to some maximum accuracy that you can achieve. Yes, question? Uh, you, you, uh, so, no, you, no, so it's this sample, you have no knowledge, this initial sample. Uh, uh, yes, you, you take actual samples, yeah. You go on the field, you do field work, yeah. But you have here no knowledge. So this is the initial, the, the stage one. Then in stage two, you have the model and you know where the prediction errors are, are highest. And you go there, but you sample proportionally to that prediction error. So where you have a high error, you put more samples. And then you refit. No, 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 it's actual. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. So this is actually going back to the field. So stage two, you go back to the field. Uh, you can you can fit a, like a, a empirical model to estimate if you want to have a drop in RMSC. Like if you do the first stage sampling, you could, uh, if let's say if you have a thousand points, yes, then you can subset these thousand points to hundred points and refit the models and see what happens with accuracy. So you simulate like the second stage. And when you simulate that, you can create a model that explains you how will accuracy drop with more samples. And that's what Madeleine was doing. Madeleine was showing you with a different number of points that the accuracy slowly goes up. Yes, so you could fit that model to estimate that. And eventually, if you want to do real engineering of, of predictive mapping, you fit that models before you do the sampling. And then you can estimate how much exactly points you will need to get to the accuracy that you want. And it could be that you need another thousand points, or it could be that you need only 50 points. Yes, yeah, I don't know. So you have to take that and do that with the data. And that's for me, the real data science. Data science is not just a one draw of you got the points are here, make the map. For me, data science is a repeated cross-checking and refitting. And it always, any project I did, I did at least five times, I refitted the models and remake the maps and checked everything and then revise again, again, again. And then the other thing about data science for mapping is that you think as an engineer and you think how, how much my accuracy changes with the sampling intensity, with the covariates, what, is the, what are the gains? And this is, I call this uh, predictograms. I call these things predictograms. I, I use the term, I don't know, um, some people pick it up, but predictograms is the, how does the predictive performance uh, changes with some parameter like the pixel size, sampling intensity, uh, num uh, type of transformation, type of model. Yes. Um, then a colleague, I use these buffer distances. Now, these buffer distances, uh, I take one point and I calculate a map. And it's very simple. So it was this code here. Um, I just put this code 
uh, and I just calculate this. So the code is short, but if I have thousand points, I calculate thousand maps. And my RAM goes poof. And also like you fit a model, we have a thousand observations and thousand covariates. It's uh, over parameterized and it's, it, it becomes very computational. So, and if I will go to 10,000 points, it's poof, it's bye-bye. I cannot do it on a laptop anymore. I will, so that's, that was a bottleneck. And then this colleague from Denmark, Anders uh, Muller, uh, they figured out that, oh, you could do this oblique distances. Oblique distances is very funny. You just take, you take this, um, uh, so uh, coordinates of the area and you uh, shift slowly and you make uh, new coordinate systems. Yes, and you do like a eight rotations or 12 rotations, they discover it's already good enough. So machine learning figure out from that, it figure out all the spatial dependence. It's a, you won't be able to do the local relationships between local uh, study area, you won't get it, but you get uh, approximately close to something you get in Creamy and stuff. Okay, so they figure that out. And I look at that algorithm and I said, okay, let's implement that. So I put that in the landman package. Uh, so I want to show you this landman package because also of the time. Um, so here is my uh, my land map. Oops. Mm. So I will do the demo for you uh, that you see. Uh, how does this uh, all implemented all together in uh, one uh, package? Let's take a look here. Uh, and this uh, this uh, landmap package, as I said, it's not on the CRAN, so you have to install it uh, from uh, GitHub. It takes few steps. Uh, you install it from uh, GitHub and they, it's uh, still, uh, it's not optimized, so it's not going to work with large data sets. So be, please be careful. Um, but officially, yes, you can uh, install it. And then let me run a simple example. Uh, so here I will put, uh, so when I start the uh, uh, library land map, uh, it's a version 0 0.3. So I will look at the example from train. So I made it a single function called train uh, spatial learner. Um, maybe I have to increase the font size. Let me see. Okay, that's better. And so let me put an example from, uh, uh, from the bottom. So this is what I said. It's a Deus Ex Machina. Um, I uh, load the packages, I load the data set, it's the mass data set. Um, and then uh, I need all these uh, packages. Uh, and then I run just the train SP learner. I said, uh, uh, lead concentration is my target. And I said, these are the covariates. And this Lambda I use because I need it for GOR. I cannot out, uh, automatically estimate it. Uh, but I, I specified as a log, uh, log transform. Uh, so I run this and now it, it goes multiple steps. Uh, and also you can see that it runs in, it will run in parallel in the back. So the CPU is now full, fully used. Uh, so it has to fit uh, using all chips um, because it's very computational. Uh, and now I get it back. Uh, all, I see um, the steps all documented here. So let's take a look at the steps. Uh, so first I need to uh, convert the flooding frequency to indicators. I do automatic that. Uh, and then also I do the principal components because I find that it's just easier to get rid of the uh, noise. And then I do oblique coordinates. Then I fit a variogram. In this case, variograms cannot be fitted. For this variable, it's uh, difficult to fit. The GOR has uh, problems. Um, and then I estimate uh, the block because I do a, a block, uh, a spatial blocks, I estimate based on the variogram. So when I do a training of the ensemble model, 
I block using uh, the size of the blocks. So I uh, block ID. So I never use the points that are next to each other for training the ensemble. Okay. And then I do the, uh, uh, I do by default, I use this uh, four learners, the ranger, uh, support vector machines, uh, uh, neural net, and uh, lasso. So I use a four learners. I, I discovered that these are the ones that usually have a good performance. Uh, and then it just goes and trains the learners using the spatial cross validation. And it runs a five time, five times refits all of these models. And then calculates this so called meta learner for which I use a linear model. So you have a linear combination of non linear models because two times non linear it's overlap. So once you solve the non linearity, you can do a linear model to get the final estimate. And then you get this uh, final model. I just feed this, uh, no, uh, this final uh, model, I fit it uh, using um, a GLM net. That's the difference because it uh, does also by iteration. And this is the ensemble. This is how ensemble looks like. So, um, and it's very clear when you use a linear model, it's, it's very good to use because you immediately see that the ranger is most important. So ranger, support vector machines, neural net and lasso. So the ranger is most important and then the least important, the usually you can do it based on the T or the, the probability of the coefficient. You can see that uh, the worst is the, the lasso. And, and these three, they're not significant. So these three uh, models, the learners, they actually, random forest doesn't need them. Yes? Um, yes, but this one is based on this block cross validation. So the, the decision about ranger is not by accident. It's not because of overfitting. It's really because the ranger uh, beats other techniques. So that's what I made sure with my programming. I made sure that the overfitting doesn't mixes the decision. And I have some other data where ranger doesn't come the best, but surprisingly, in 80% of cases, random forest is the killer. It's really the thing that fits itself. Yes? Bigger uh, neural networks are uh, sensitive to specific data. For many reprocessing, in this case, for example, why the neural networks are not optimizing their performance? Uh, what what do you mean by scale? The the scale of the values. Um, yes, I do that with principal components. Yes, I do with principal components. I I do scale principal components. So yes, question. Yes. Yes. Yes, but using spatial cross validation. Yes. Uh, so, so because you fit everything five times with the spatial cross validation, then you uh, and and then you use these uh, points that you take out from the uh, model fitting to fit the final model. So these points are never taken in the in the fitting of individual models. You could get it from the object. You could put it to print it. Yes. Yes, but, uh, and, and you see there's no mistake, um, and I will show you later on uh, differences, but let me let me look at some other. So now I just switched to another. I had, the, uh, I put zinc uh, and I refit it. Uh, it does the same thing. I could turn off, for example, principal components. I could say I want to turn it off. Uh, and I could put a different learners, I could put 10 learners also, but I notice it doesn't, you know, the few learners that stick out and the other learners, you know, it just uh, don't even bother like GLM or something. Anywhere you have a bit of non-linearity, random forest support vector machines, lasso, they will, uh, they will uh, 
uh, prevail. And then uh, this was the second one. So let's take a look at this one. It's a bit different. Um, and now you see that the uh, neural net, it's, a, it's also comparable to Ranger. Um, so you see sometimes Ranger is not the only. Um, and, but you see these other two, they, they are not significant. They're, the coefficients are very small and not significant. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, neural net and uh, Ranger, they are significant. Um, and so when I make the prediction, let's make a prediction. And, and now I just say predict M, you see the code is compact. Uh, so you say fit the model, predict basically, that's it. Uh, you make the prediction um, and it predicts the, uh, the um, response and also predicts each individual learner. So you have also each individual learner and then it calculates the standard deviation uh, of the significant learners. So it takes the unsignificant learners out and it calculates the uh, accumulated standard deviation per pixel um, and then it looks like this so this was the zinc um, with the so this is with ensemble so not only distances but this is the this includes the uh, oblique distances uh, features um, and includes the ensembling so it's all wrapped together and then you get this is the map and and the same thing I also plotted in uh, plot KML so you can see here and, and these are actual values of the zinc. So you see here, there's some high values of zinc. And so we predict about 1,600 here and it's measured 1,800. So there is a bit of smoothing. It doesn't go exactly to the point, uh, but it was very interesting to see that this point, which is relatively high, 1,670, and this point gets cut out. Because I think when you do with a smaller data set, if you do this uh, repeated cross-validation, then uh, if a single point sticks out, it has a very low probability to be included in the model. It's very, if, if there were two points, a bit better chance, three points, it will sure make a hotspot. But as a single point, it's smoothed that out. And that's a difference from Kriging. That's a difference because in Kriging you have just a single fit and that's it. And here you have like, uh, here you have like, so four learners, five times fitted, that's 20 fits. And you have the, the, the meta learner, so that's a 21 fit. So there's lots of fits, lots of trial and error, and it uh, eats this point. Um, and so let's take a look at, but so that's interesting is to look at this error. And here's the error map. And, and this is also something new I'm seeing, something I don't see with the Krieging, you know, so you see, you see the extrapolation effects. Uh, so here the high errors a bit, uh, but the errors can also be high when the values are lower. Um, and of course the highest errors are where the errors are high. Because if you take these high points, if you take them in and out, uh, the models will perform differently. And then also on the page, on the, on the uh, GitHub page, um, uh, let's see. So on the GitHub page, if you look um, on the land map, you can see I put a little animation and these are these individual learners. And so here's animation, it's very interesting. Uh, these are these individual learners that are produced by subsetting, so uh, fivefold. So you take 20% out, you fit with 80% da, da, da. And so it's a really, really, uh, uh, varies a lot, right? This is the different ranges. These are five ranges and these are five times XG boost. So they really differ because if it's a smaller data set, especially it will be very sensitive if you randomly take some high points in and out uh, so there's a quite a variation. And then what the assemble does is it stacks that, it's called a stacking process, it stacks that into a single, there's a question, okay. Let me see, question. How to resample an error if you consider time variation? So I, do you mean like uh, uh, for the space-time uh, modeling? So for the space-time modeling, you would do also like a block, blocks, but you have to do a space-time blocks. So you like make cubes in space-time, and then you take the points in these cubes only either for training or validation. So if I understand you correctly, Hugo. Yes, two, two more questions. Not all assumptions, but it's free from uh, anisotropy, uh, from uh, the stationarity assumptions, constant variogram, it's uh, free. It doesn't need them. And, uh, 
Doesn't the component do it, or you just need the component value from the uh, from the image of the computer? No, data science is all about tuning, tuning to infinity. Absolutely, Every, as long as you have improvement. But once the tuning brings you to a plateau, uh, in the landman package, okay, it's a good point. In the landman package at the moment, I don't, I didn't build in the tuning. I don't, I just have a, a, the tuning of the ensembler. So that only that is a, because it's a five fold. So uh, that's the only, but I didn't incorporate feature selection and uh, for example, random forest fine tuning. Thing. So you have to do it outside. But as soon as I get time, I will, it's only a few lines of code. Uh, it just becomes even more computational. I cannot put this, the, the, again, the problem with the machine learning, like I use this simple example of mass data set, 155 points, three covariates, all little data, but I compute 10,000 or 100,000 more than uh, doing rigging. And I cannot put this example in the package because it has to run within five seconds. And I, I could run it in five seconds, but on some computer, a big computer, but I have to send it if it runs on their server in five seconds on CAN. So I have a problem. Yes, question. Okay, so, uh, so when you look at this error map, which I think is quite good, uh, and it does pick up this uh, hot spot you see here, it's a bit higher. Uh, so both, both points get a high error. Uh, so where would you go and sample? So you could do a random sample uh, using these errors. Uh, uh, so like a square, square value, because this is standard deviation. So squared value of this is a weight, is a weight for the mapping. So you can do, you can, you know, you can do in the spot start package, you can draw a, a random point pattern, but with a, a different intensity. Okay, so I will do proportional intensity to the errors. So you will get few more points here. You will get more points here. And everywhere you have yellow, you probably won't get any more points because model has no problems where it's yellow. Model has problems where it's bluish and, and different colors. This is standard deviation of significant. So, so yes, good, let me show you that. So this is the, uh, so when I make the prediction, Uh, so I get this uh, object and this object, let me see, uh, looks like this. Uh, so it has, the object is a spatial pixels data frame. So that's the prediction. And then these are the response values. And this model error is calculated. The model error is calculated as the variance between different models fitted independently in cross validation. So it's kind of like a bootstrapping kind of like a bootstrapping, but with a small number. I only have like four, uh, but I exclude from standard deviation, I exclude the ones that are not significant because I notice that that creates, uh, it blows up standard deviation and it's artificial. Uh, and so what you see that standard deviation, it's quite high because of this cross validation, because I do a fourth walk cross validation, spatial cross validation. So the values actually, the errors are high. They go, they go up to 500. And uh, the values of the variable, they go up to 1,000, uh, uh, 1,400, 1,600. Yes, so the, the, the values of the errors are high because if I do this with this uh, spatial cross validation, it's always, uh, you know, it's a, a symbol that's likely to randomly sample uh, in the area. So maybe they are too pessimistic. I'm not sure. Uh, could be that a bit too pessimistic with standard errors. Uh, but uh, uh, when we do the testing of the accuracy of the errors in the paper, the PJ paper, uh, we got actually that, uh, uh, what they saw, we were just this buffer, this is not assembly. And then we got that they were more optimistic, the errors we get. Uh, so that this thing I still have to develop. I still, here I need the help. So Andreas, if you're interested uh, in contributing to useful package, that would be a perfect spot to uh, help us make that estimate of the error. Uh, ensemble model error a um, bit more robust. And I think the bootstrapping is the way to go. It's just I'm warned that I cannot do this 100 times. I need to have something computationally efficient. I need a bootstrapping, which is based on like five draws or something. Um, and that's what I worry if I, if I make a mistake, then we might be criticized for that. So that's the thing still, I think it's a, 
it's an open area. And I did post it, by the way, on Stock Exchange. Exactly that problem, uh, I posted it. Uh, so, let me see, I need to log into my Stock Exchange. Uh, so that's this one. Uh, so how do you derive prediction uh, errors for ensemble machine learning model stocks? Uh, and then I went and I answered myself. I answered myself, so I'm really lonely here. Please join me. Uh, yes, but I, I did uh, put it with the example from the package. So it's all documented properly. So you don't need any data. You just run the code and let me know what you think. How would you do it? Um, uh, some people, yes, they did say something to do that, but uh, at the moment we don't, there's no solution MLR. MLR is not going to give you a, a error of the of stacking, of the stack predictor. Uh, so yes, I can share you that with uh, the um, uh, MetaMouse, let me see. So I will send it on my channel. So if you want to help, uh, community development, uh, solve it here, please. Uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, slowly, I'm finishing in my, uh, everything I want to say. Uh, just, just very quickly, I want to show you that this um, ensembling, uh, it can be extended now also to factor uh, binomial variable. So for classification, it's like, I trying to do like a carrot. So you just say, instead of, uh, numeric variable, I have now factors. Um, so this is the soil type. So we have three soil types. And it's, there's no change. You just say, uh, fit the model, but you do, uh, instead of regression tasks, you do classification task. Uh, and then you do prediction. And again, you predict uh, the same thing. And uh, here's the map. So you have uh, three classes and you predict the probability per class. So it's, and it also has geographical distances. And you see here oblique distances, they do come up that you can, they're visibly, they do come up because it creates these smooth surfaces. So other covariates don't come. Uh, so it, it kind of does a creaking on the uh, factors. And then very interestingly, you can also do the errors uh, per class. And, uh, and then you very interesting to see that we have transition between classes, actually not a problem. Uh, but where you have like this class is the, the class one, uh, the highest errors, and then this class three is uh, less difficult uh, to map. So also very interesting. Um, and then also we did it on the sick data set. This is a bit bigger data set, so if I'll just run this thing. Uh, and you see it does exa it's exactly the same. You get the credit and distance, but now you have 450 points, there's more points. And this is where machine learning now starts performing better because as you get more points, more complex relationship, more nonlinear relation, that's where the uh, machine learning is a, a really winner. And so uh, this takes a bit more time and then you get again the predictions and the error map. It looks like this. Um, so you have um, the, uh, the um, ah. I hate when these points move. Uh, so, so you get the uh, errors are highest where you have the high values. But there also you have some places like uh, hilltops or something where maybe the extrapolation areas, the, uh, the features are underrepresented. Uh, so it will show up areas where you have a high error. So it also like, it looks like these valleys here. This is uh, Switzerland, of course. These valleys, they have a less error, uh, but here they have a high error because also you have high values. But you have also here, you have, for example, lower values, but you can also still have higher errors. And so that's a nice property. It's completely non-stationary. So you can, you're not dependent only on the values, but you're really independent on these differences in uh, fits and uh, variation between learners. So, okay, so that was all uh, from my side. I'm going to now pass the floor to Mohamed Reza. Um, we call him also Mo, a short one. And, and so uh, this thing, I show you this implementation, this is all done MLR. So I build up land map on top of MLR. And what he's going to do now, show you what, uh, what you can do with the MLR tree. Um, I just worry about the connection to your computer. Let me see. Um, maybe the internet. Yeah. Mm. I think something happened. 
There was this is the same, right? Uh, oh, here, here. I, if you just uh, put the, if you remember the code. No. Yes. Yeah, because uh, something happened, I don't know. Just this, this computer. Yeah. What's the code of that? Huh? How did you get the code last time? Okay. Okay, then you do without them. You just leave it. Yeah, but you cannot. You cannot connect the. You see, that's what you discovered. You cannot connect. It. You could. You could do the demo maybe today afternoon. Okay, I pass it on to you now, then uh, you can present here. So uh, you just need this one so people can hear. And I'll leave the demo then for the. But there's no, no time to copy now. And that's the same number, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening. It's just uh, maybe it just doesn't work with uh, Zoom at the same time. I know, but you see, it's just off. I'm sorry. It's um. Yeah, we have to stop. You you go and uh, just present, and you'll do the demo after. I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe I can. Uh, Okay. I mean, no, you cannot the because they need to be brought up. Okay. Uh, so, hi everybody. My name is Mohamed Reza. A bit long full name, Mohamed Reza Sheikh Musa. But everybody calls Mo here. And uh, yeah, I'm a researcher at Open Jew Hub. And uh, I'm today going to give you a bit of introduction to MLR3. And before that, I would like to know how many of you so far worked with the MLR3? And how many have worked with MLR? And have you heard about MLR3 or MLR? Okay, cool. So I think this is going to be a bit uh, then productive. Uh, about MLR3 and uh, you know, it's a successor of MLR. And uh, so let's start with uh, what is the purpose of my presentation. I'm trying to convince you guys to use MLR3. I'm not a representative, but just a fan of MLR3 and the team. And uh, yeah, there is no uh, like a profit, uh, personal profit in it. So. Uh, they are really nice team, by the way. Uh, they are really expert in this uh, machine learning. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to convince you to use a bit maybe more frequently. So the overview of uh, my presentation is going to, I'm going to give you a bit of intro, uh, just basic stuff. And then uh, the building blocks of uh, MLR3, some personal experience about MLR3 and the demo, unfortunately not now. So uh, what is nice about MLR3, they come with our fixed class system, which is also a bit of pain because it's a uh, like kind of different ecosystem from 
uh, the other uh, are uh, built-in reference classes. So it's a bit of pain to change from, for example, S3 to this uh, R6 uh, class system, but the advantage is it's really simpler. I mean, if you use it, if you start using it, then you, you, you get to know more about uh, this ecosystem and it's way faster, lightweight, and blah, blah. And uh, MLR3 itself, uh, unlike Carrot, which has everything in one box, is a modular uh, package. So for each different uh, process, for example, for tuning, you have one package which is MLR3, for example, tuning. For, I don't know, for getting some learners, you have one different package, which called MLR3 learners, for example. So it's a modular, and that, uh, and that makes it so easier for them also to, to maintain the whole process, because like, it's a pain if you have one package and all things in, within one package. And it makes also uh, more simpler for users to just use those packages that they need, not to install a whole package. So, uh, yeah, that's, as I said, this is a successor of MLR. Unfortunately, I think just 10 people also heard about MLR. But the focus of uh, MLR3 is on the computational time. So if you want to do something in production, uh, maybe not now, but it's going to be I think the best, like in coming years for, com uh, for production. So really focus on computation using uh, R6 and data table, and uh, also for the computational, uh, for parallelization use a uh, future apply, I think package. Future and future apply. Uh, and also, yeah, less recursive dependency. So again, makes it more simpler. And uh, yeah, uh, some additional functionality, for example, for parallelization comes from future apply and future, as I said. And they won this uh, prize, uh, I think it was 2019. Uh, it was a big competition. So the team is really now well known in the community, at least for data science, not really for remote sensing, but uh, we are also like in a close collaboration with them to provide some packages related to geospatial domain together with Tom and uh, some uh, friends in MLR3 team. And we are thinking of uh, like having another package next to MLR3 ecosystem. Uh, I think we agreed the name of MLR3 raster something, but it's going to be very, very, uh, fun and very, very complicated, uh, we'll see. So the ecosystem of MLR3, as you can see, uh, MLR3 uh, itself is in the heart. So you install MLR3 for sure, for every activity. But if you want to go, for example, for uh, mm, learners, to get some learners, you go only to MLR3 learners, then you just uh, install that package in uh, Load it into your uh, machine. So you don't need to, for example, to go, I don't know, to install whole the packages like carrot. So this is, uh, I think, is an advantage. So very light. And you can see um, the maturity level of each different packages. In the color code, uh, write down if you see the stable, maturing, experimental, and planned. This uh, map. Like uh, this graph, uh, one month ago, I would say it was, it was a bit more red and more red, uh, yellowish, but now it's more uh, just green. So they are really developing fast. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's also the case. So different people are responsible for different packages, uh, and uh, but they are all like, uh, yeah, they're also like a one supervisor or two supervisor, uh, which is uh, kind of guiding people. But uh, it's very nice. I mean, the way they structure also is very nice. The way they uh, doing things, uh, completely new. 
I really uh, enjoy also working with them. And uh, that's why, for example, MLR TV, yeah. Uh, okay, you, you can see MLR3, especially temporal. Uh, that's the only package related to geospatial. But the guy who is behind this uh, package, I mean, is responsible, is like really a computer scientist. Uh, still, he's making a uh, really nice thing, and we are like uh, in a close collaboration with that guy to uh, take from this step to go to more advanced uh, geospatial related uh, package, which uses uh, MLR3 ecosystem with all the fantastic uh, advantages and get rid of also those uh, three classes that, that is uh, already read, uh, is exists in, uh, ML, uh, in our community, let's say. So if you have questions uh, till now, none, okay, yeah. H2O, uh, actually I haven't used H2O, but uh, I think, yeah, I think a bit, but still I think uh, is a bit more about computational time. Uh, computationally, I'm not sure about H2O because I never use H2O. But uh, maybe Tom has a comment about yeah, H2O because Tom? Uh, um, and they're American huh okay that's also one aspect And for those who are also in favor of deep learning, MLR3 cross is uh, experimental uh, for now, but is developing fast. You can use it now, but just a bit simple, like really network. But you can use it for tabular data. Um, this MLR3 cross. So uh, my personal experience about MLR3, uh, uh, yeah, I would say for the for the downside. They are not mature as MLR for now. And uh, documentation wise, they are poor. So you can't find a lot of documentation for, for now in the like the Stack Overflow or other repos. So it's a bit of pain. If you want to do something new, uh, you need to do a lot of, I mean, it's effort. So first run is real pain. <laughs> and uh, there are like some bug issues and uh, different level of maturity, as I said, with, uh, among the packages. And that's also a bit of pain because uh, you don't know really which one is. you should check every every day because they're really uh, growing daily. So the pros is also yeah they are fast developing, super friendly and skilled people. And if you raise an issue in the GitHub, they will reply you the same day with the full attention. So very very professional. So that's really really cool actually I would say. So uh, unfortunately, I can't run the demo, but uh, for the, they have, okay. Uh, so I just, here I brought an example, how it works like, a, uh, for example, if you want to know what learners are there, you just simply say, uh, as a table MLR learners, and you can see the keys. For now, they have 28 uh, different learners that you can see here, but, I would say like weekly they are adding things. Let's 
And uh, for example, for MLR uh, measures, which like, I don't know, accuracy, RMSC, different measures, uh, you also have for now 81 keys. That is also good. Uh, also, they are like, really love again adding. For the sampling method, they for now have 19 uh, the sampling methods. Those who start with SPCV is a spatial cross validation, and that one, uh, the 17, is a spatial temporal cross validation. So, a lot of uh, also, I mean, the, uh, yeah, just one moment. Uh, a spatial cross validation is involved. Yeah, please. This is MLR2. I'm talking just a yeah, that's a, uh, I mean, that's a, how it, they wrote it. So this is index, uh, but it's MLR3. So you can't uh, have this in MLR for sure. I mean, if you write as data table, yes, it doesn't work in uh, MLR. Yeah, that's a syntax. So uh, uh, it's sometimes also confusing for me because when you run, uh, load the library into the URL commission, it's MLR3. But here is MLR. But that doesn't matter uh, as long as it works well. So resampling method, very, I would say rich, they still working on it and they want to have also more temporal aspect in the in the resampling method. So it's very good, They're pretty much good, really. Uh, so demos, I think I stop here because uh, it, it turned out to be uh, the uh, but yeah I just I don't get the connection I can try but um, I don't know if you it would see. be very nice to also see like a thing oh, well yeah. let me see Somehow it just doesn't want, it doesn't want to connect. Leave it, yeah, just. Um, okay, I had also, um, <coughs> uh, just to finish this thing with conclusions. So uh, ensemble machine learning, I see for many of you it's new. Uh, for me now it's my main culture. I don't, I do very little individual models. I'm just interested in ensembles. Uh, and there are many packages and uh, you can also use H2O if you prefer. Uh, then you can still do in Caret, uh, although it's less and less uh, maintained. I think it's now these tidy models. And there is also just a package called Super Learner, which has uh, all the um, uh, learners. Um, and then uh, these geographical oblique distances can be used to uh, incorporate the spatial dependence. And in a way, you don't need them to do creating anymore. Um, uh, then this uh, fine tuning feature selection and assembly. So these three steps that I do in every project, always I do fine tuning, feature selection, uh, assembling. Uh, it can be fully automated. Actually, it's uh, really scary how much, uh, you know, if you connect the right uh, functionality in R today, uh, it's really scary. You could really automate the whole processes. And uh, we are even thinking now to do uh, uh, this thing, uh, uh, this repository, we have this uh, global data sets, uh, meteorology, soils, vegetation. So that's uh, vegetation. Uh, this is uh, climate uh, meteorology. This is soil chemical, soil physical properties, natural vegetation. So we're thinking to automate the whole thing and we just leave it running on a server and we just generate the maps. Um, uh, and then um, we publish the maps when we see that the accuracy, there's increase in accuracy. So uh, we keep on recomputing and uh, the new points, if we add extra points, we recompute and we see if there's a high accuracy, then we publish the data. Otherwise we keep the old version. So we could at automate the whole thing. Um, it doesn't mean that we will retire though. Uh, there was some, once there was a company in California, they uh, uh, made a machine learning for predicting the uh, stock market and uh, they call it prediction company. Uh, and they thought that they will be able to retire because the they had uh, with these automated algorithms, they will buy and sell and they would just generate money. So they, they said that we went to a restaurant, we came back, we earned 1 million. Yes, <laughs> but uh, uh, then uh, later on they, uh, they lost that million. 
because the the stock market is chaotic so there's no way that you can do any machine learning to predict that you only you could do only maybe to predict these little moments to earn like little amounts but not large amounts it's impossible because you can never predict coronavirus outbreaks or, or wars or whatever it's impossible um so yes so that was about the uh, ensemble machine learning and then you saw for the spatial data uh, please test the package but be careful uh, it's uh, it's buggy uh, if you find an issue please report it uh, we try to fix and uh, we will put it in cran soon uh, i do need to fine tune it a bit more so it runs efficiently now it's a fully parallelized so every time you run it uh, it will parallelize it uh, so i was actually getting happy with that package and then about uh, nine months ago they said oh we stopped with mlr mlr3 we don't maintain it anymore and so what happened is that now we have to i have to move all the code and even it even gets more complicated because they don't have the whole stacking uh, now uh, mohammed Reza will show they don't have the whole stacking implemented so uh, now I, I have to wait till they finish everything in mlr3 and only then i can do a transition so that that got a bit more complicated but uh, nevertheless you know you could test it with your own data see deus ex machina uh, basically you just take the point data you take the covariates and poof uh, you get the map uh, and it will have an isotropy it will have uh, you know spatial dependent structure uh, it's all there it's uh, it's uh, actually too good to be true right but uh, yeah it's possible and yes questions so the, these uh, stack learners the ensembles they they don't they they have it but they don't have uh, the, all the learners the, not all the learners they're slowly coming they're being integrated and then some operations you cannot it's not complete you cannot run you can do now the the uh, uh, super learner can you do in uh, mlr tree yes and you can you put the blocking parameter and everything okay well that Okay, so it's so Mohammed Reza will do a demo, so you see. Uh, part of the space. I mean, at the end, when I want to take a decision, as a decision maker afterwards, I don't want to someone to tell me that, look, the top this part, you have higher concentration. I want to do why. So, by using the coordinates, maybe I mask the influence of the other coordinates that would be more important, like, for example, the knowledge properties or something. No, no. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Yes, and I remember I said that uh, I my enthusiasm in machine learning was really exploded, and then later on I had I shoot myself in the foot and uh, problems uh, artifacts, and I also don't understand why this happens. And then this is this interpreter machine learning. That's what it comes. So diagnostic plots. Uh, then you have the variable importance plots. In this paper, we also do that. Uh, the variable importance. So it looks like this. Uh, so you fit the uh, at once you fit the uh, spatial and feature space and then you have to plot uh, you have to look at the variable importance so let me see this um, so yeah yeah you should look at that and you should see and uh, that's the variable importance uh, this uh, this table and so so what happens is the uh, the accuracy is okay uh, but now we want to understand uh, how does it relate and then you for example do variable importance and so what happens is that the the pc1 is the most important the first component for that variable and then a distance to the station number 54 is still with the buffer distances so the station 54 is highly influential on the prediction so that's the one type of diagnostic then you do the also uh, partial correlation plots and you can do all these things from this book interpretable machine learning you can apply it on this now sp uh, spatial interpolation problem and that way you can then okay i i can explain you what's happening yes okay 
but you this thing you cannot do with geostatistics that at the same time you see what's the impo uh, importance of geography and specific locations and the feature space at the same time and that's a big advantage because here you do uh, modeling at once and in universal creating regression creating it's a chicken egg you have to get the variogram but you need to get the residual so you need the regression and then once you have the volume you have to estimate these general least squares for regression so it's a chicken egg it's a it's a cumbersome and here you do it at once and remember i told you you can do these complex distances watershed distances so maybe some watershed distance will pop up very high very important then you say well you have here high concentration because the things stream down or they come because you're close to the river or something and then you can explain but then you do the variable importance diagnostics are there any questions from people online yes there's a one more question how can we get chorus from rfsp then use those chorus with other uh, can we get uh, yes so if you followed my talk um, uh, i don't recommend just doing the random forest anymore uh, you should basically uh, do it once uh, pick up uh, even like 10 uh, learners uh, strong learners and then you do ensemble and in ensembling you can maybe reduce again to like three top learners or four top learners that's what usually happens uh, that as you saw in this example that only few learners they will uh, stick out uh, so like um, this one so when i when i did the, the summary uh, here um, what happens is just a few learners but but yes you could uh, you could test also um you can you can extend i mean i could just go to this modeling where i do the uh, train learner and i would just add extra learners and it will then do with six learners you know it's also there's nothing changes this is fully scalable so so the code my code is now okay that you know it's fully scalable it's automatically parallelized uh and it's all automated uh, without creating artifacts uh but still i have to now move to mlr3 and things so it's going to take time okay there's no more questions online i think so we can uh, uh we can stop the sharing and i call now mohammed reza just to do the demo of the mlr3 just very quickly and then we go for lunch thank you all for uh, uh following <laughs>